Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are having a few technical problems here. Yeah, I, I can see uh, the screen. Okay, I think we can start now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. let's let's give it a minute. Can we uh, wait a minute or two? Okay, sure, sure. Cool. <clears throat> I'm ready to go. Okay, right. Um... It is my great pleasure this morning to welcome back to City University of Macau, Professor Klaus Laris. He has been here twice before in person um, and considering the technical issues we've just been facing, I'm beginning to think it would have been a great deal easier if he'd come back in person um, for this third visit. Uh, Professor Lapis is a very well-known specialist in international affairs. He is the Richard M. Prasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is right on the other side of the world from us. So we're dealing with a, a 12 hour time difference at the moment. Um, besides being an academic, he has also been counselor and senior policy advisor at the German embassy in Beijing a couple of years ago. Um, he and I have known each other since I think sometime in the 1990s, and when we've been on visiting appointments and fellowships in Washington and at Princeton, we have overlapped with each other. So we have come to know each other quite well by now. Um, Professor Laris is particularly known for his very big book, Churchill's Cold War, which was published by Yale University Press in 2002. He also has two major studies forthcoming. Um, last week, you heard from uh, Professor Tom Schwartz on Henry Kissinger. Um, his um, new book coming out with Yale, sorry, Professor Larry's new book coming out with Yale at the end of this year is Uncertain Allies, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Threat of a United Europe. Um, and he is also bringing out a book on dictators and autocrats, how they came to power and managed holding onto it. This is only a small number of the books that he has written or edited. He is an extremely prolific scholar. Um, and today he's going to be talking to us about the situation of the world and particularly relations between China, um, the US and Europe. 
in a lecture with the title Escalating Tensions, China, the US, the Quad, and the EU in the post-pandemic world. Um, well, we're not quite in a post-pandemic world as yet, so this is looking at the future as well as the past. Klaus, I'm really pleased to welcome you here. I apologize for the various glitches. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Priscilla. It's a pleasure to be back, though indeed I would have rather uh, come back live and joined you live and enjoyed the nice dinners and the nice hotel in Macau, not uh, to speak of the gambling, which of course we never did in the past. Now it's a great pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting me and thanks for your very kind introduction, much too generous. Uh, I would also like to say hello to some people, some followers from the Krasno event series who have joined us tonight. I'm very grateful to see my friend from Dubai, Oliver Stelling, for example, Joycelyn Ford from uh, DC, also Sarah Wu here from Chapel Hill, right in my own house, and uh, a number of other people. It's really great to, um, to see all of you here. Tonight, I would like to talk about the um, global events which are unfolding before our eyes. And uh, it is really um, circling around the American-Chinese relationship. And I would say the competitive uh, relationship, which is increasingly getting worse. But before I start with my talk, I would like to go to the second slide. And for those of you who, ha uh, who haven't yet uh, heard about it, I would like to advertise the Krasno Global Event Series, which Priscilla also briefly mentioned. Uh, that is our very active lecture series with um, leading scholars, diplomats, and uh, economists, and journalists, and other people. And um, we are also reachable by Zoom. If you are not yet on our mailing list, send me an email and you will be uh, informed of what is coming uh, next in our series. For example, next Monday, we have the former German Foreign Minister, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, uh, visiting us and who will talk to us about global affairs next Monday. And can we go to uh, the next uh, slide, please? Yes, and that is what I would like to talk about today. I would briefly talk about the main essentials of Biden's foreign policy, then the competition between the United States and China, talk about the EU and China, and also briefly about the Quad. And then hopefully it is not too early to talk about the post-pandemic world. Let's start with the Biden's foreign policy. And that brings us to the next slide, please. Yes, that's it. Um, I think on the whole, the United States was quite lucky after the Trump administration that Biden was elected president. His could well be a historic presidency. If you think back to the Trump administration and the incompetence and the chaos and the general unpredictability of his presidency, then you realize what a stable and what a reliable and predictable presidency has unfolded just now since January 2021. However, Biden is not someone who wants to rest on his laurel of 34 years in the Senate and as vice president of uh, President Obama's. He actually has a very radical program. First of all, he has a very radical domestic program. And of course, foreign policy and relations with other countries is always based on domestic policy, on bringing the American public in that case along. Regarding his domestic program, he wants to embark on a major infrastructure program, which refers to bridges and roads, but also to climate change and to um, uh, internet infrastructure and that kind of thing, also education. He wants to approach race relations uh, and the uh, fundamental reform of how policing in the United States is done. He wants to embark on uh, uh, reforming the tax system, particularly for corporations. He wants to rein in big tech companies like Microsoft and Apple and, and others. And of course, as I said already, he is very interested in uh, uh, climate change and in green policies. If he brings through all these initiatives, which I've just mentioned, then his would truly be a historic and very radical uh, presidency. Of course, it needs to be seen. It remains to be seen whether that is actually possible. 
In terms uh, of foreign policy, Biden is actually seriously um, uh, threatened by a number of crises which could blow up any minute. There is, for example, still the relationship with Iran. They're trying to, in Vienna, there are negotiations and talks taking place to revive uh, the nuclear deal of 2015. And the signals from Iran are contradictory. The Iranian president has said that he is hopeful that a deal can be achieved. The um, Supreme Leader Khamenei of Iran is very pessimistic about that a deal can be achieved. So we really don't know what is happening that could blow up and not be a successful renegotiation of the deal with all the consequences which would come uh, from that. And Israel, which is opposed to the Iranian deal, would uh, has uh, you know developed into a very tense relationship with the Biden administration. Next week, actually, uh, Israeli diplomats will arrive in Washington to talk about the crisis atmosphere in American-Israeli relations. Another crisis which could blow up is North Korea. North Korea has recently tested new uh, ballistic missiles. Um, for the first time during the Biden administration, and that could get worse. We also know North Korea is threatened by an immense famine. People are starving in North Korea, not least because the whole country was closed down due to the COVID crisis. And if such a domestic uh, unstable situation uh, 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 um, unfolds in uh, North Korea, then that is not only very regrettable and very bad for the people of North Korea, that of course also is uh, perhaps even endangering the North Korean regime and you do not know how they would react. Another serious crisis is the crisis with uh, Russia about Ukraine. We know that at the border to Ukraine, there are around about 100,000 Russian troops which have been amassed there in the last few weeks. People are talking about a potential invasion by President Putin of uh, Eastern Ukraine. Of course, we don't know if that is correct, whether he is just threatening, whether he is not intending to do anything. But this is also a crisis which could blow up at any minute. And another crisis is the crisis about Taiwan. Um, only recently, we have had 23 incursions by Chinese uh, fighter jets in the defense uh, zone of Taiwan. This is worrying. This has never happened before. In January, there were 13 incursions of 13 fighter jets trying to get or go, uh, going into that defense zone of Taiwan. Now, uh, last week, we have seen 23 um, the Chinese fighter jets. This is definitely something which could also blow up at any minute, which we naturally don't hope that will happen, but uh, the threat is there. So all these foreign policy crises are sitting really in a way on uh, President Biden's desk, and he has a lot on his hands to deal with that. But let me uh, um, mention three major characteristics of uh, Biden's foreign policy as far as I can see. First of all, he wants to cooperate again with his transatlantic allies. That was much neglected under the Trump administration. And Biden is intent on building a, a firmer alliance of democratic countries. When he was still campaigning to become president, he talked about a democracy summit, which he would like to hold in the course of 2021. Recently, we haven't really heard much about it, but the intention is clear. He wants to intensify America's relations with the allies in Europe, but also, of course, with countries such as Canada, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and others. And part of that cooperation with allies is also uh, the, the building up of new investment deals and new infrastructure deals. And the idea behind it is that China's Belt and Road Initiative needs to be uh, contained and needs to be answered with an initiative uh, by the United States and its allies. Um, and uh, here, uh, America's allies actually quite agree with uh, the Biden administration. For example, only a few days ago, the EU and India started negotiations about an investment deal, which uh, they intend to complete by May. So what is happening, uh, as you can see, that the United States and the EU, to some extent, has, have taken the initiative to build up a competitor to China's Belt and Road Initiative, 
And at the same time, they want to strengthen the transatlantic allies and the friends and partners of the United States to bring that into a more coherent and a more stable form. Because as we know, during the Trump administration, that of uh, uh, America's traditional friendship with its allies um, in Europe and elsewhere was much uh, weakened. The second point the climate, uh, the, the Biden administration has uh, seriously embarked upon is a climate change policy. We have never seen anything like that before. Under Obama and Clinton, also under Bush, you had you know, attempts at the margins to do something about the changing climate, the increasing pollution of the earth. Uh, under Trump, we of course noticed that Trump didn't take climate change seriously at all. He dismissed it entirely. Biden is the first president who has really taken climate change uh, seriously as a, a threat to the earth, to the further existence of the earth. And um, there will be a summit tomorrow even and on Friday, an international summit to talk about what can be done to keep the rise of the earth's uh, temperature, uh, 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 contain that rise and to, to uh, lower it and to make sure that it doesn't increase uh, more than 1.5% to pre-industrialist times. And there will be a United Nations climate uh, change at the end of the year in Glasgow. And here, the United States will also be highly active. What can uh, be seen that tomorrow, uh, President Putin of Russia and President Xi Jinping of China will also participate. Despite the tension with Russia and with China, uh, both uh, presidents have agreed that climate change is so important that despite all the tension, they will participate. And this is, of course, also a chance to cooperate and to get to each other, uh, to get to know uh, each other a little better. Uh, the United States has a uh, very ambitious goal for uh, the next few years. It wants to cut a carbon output by 50% uh, by 2013 as compared to 2005. The EU has an even more ambitious goal. It wants to cut it by uh, over 55%, but compared to 1990, which is, of course, a much tougher goal. And the UK has a similar goal. So there's a lot of pressure on China to actually do something similar. So far, uh, President Xi Jinping has said that it, uh, China wants to uh, achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. And um, the United States and other countries have said this is too late. The, United, the China needs to improve its game and perhaps uh, bring it down to 2015 or even further and also make sure that uh, the peak of uh, carbon output in China is actually not achieved in 2013, as President Xi Jinping has said, but perhaps already in 2025. So there's a lot of uh, pressure on China to do its bit and to improve its performance uh, regarding uh, polluting the environment. And uh, above all, uh, what China is accused of is that it is still using too much coal. And coal is highly polluting, it's even more polluting than oil and gas. And uh, there's pressure on China to actually not build new coal power stations and shut down and cut down on the old coal power stations. So climate change is the second major foreign policy initiative by the Biden administration. And the third and last major initiative, as far as I can see, is that Biden has embarked on what I would like to call a hybrid foreign policy with America's rifles. Uh, when you think about Russia, for example, there's lots of tension with Russia about the Navalny uh, affair, that opposition politician who is languishing on hunger strike in a, a Russian prison. Now he has been transferred to a, um, to a hospital within a prison, but he is close to uh, dying. And this is a very severe situation, but President Putin has not agreed to releasing him, for example, or to giving him appropriate medical care by his own doctors. There, as I said, there are up to 100,000 troops at the Ukrainian border. And only yesterday, Putin was uh, um, very uh, adamant in his words when he addressed the nation. Uh, and he said there was a coup attempt in Belarus, which the West apparently has instigated, and that he does not, uh, that he wants the West not to um, 
go over certain red lines. So it's not quite clear which red lines he actually meant. Still, Putin is participating in the climate deal. And also Putin and Biden also talked on the phone last week. And Biden invited Putin to a bilateral summit to talk about Ukraine and talk about other issues of tension. Uh, on the whole, I think this is an example that uh, Biden has a hybrid foreign policy. He is tough on Russia. He has imposed sanctions for election meddling of Russia, for the solar winds um, uh, um, digital um, incursion of Russian technicians into the uh, networks, the uh, computer networks of many American government uh, agencies and corporations. But at the same time, he also does not cut off all relations and leaves open the possibility to talk. And I think that is also that kind of hybrid foreign policy is also Biden's approach to China. And that brings me to the next um, uh, slide, please. Yes, um, thank you. Um, Biden has said that there is severe competition with China. Uh, uh, but Biden has also uh, explained that he wants to be more transparent, more predictable uh, than Trump was, and that uh, he doesn't want to surprise any foreign countries with any actions he has taken. And so far, I think he has stood up to that. What is the Chinese-American conflict all about? Above all, it is about the immense human rights and international uh, law violations of the Chinese, at least from a Western point of view. There are issues regarding Hong Kong and the introduction of the national security in Hong Kong. And you know much better about that than I know, living so close to Hong Kong. Then there is issue about the South China Sea, where China does not recognize any other claims to much of the South China Sea and its reefs, rocks, and uninhabited islands in the South China Sea, its resources, its fishing rights, and so on. Um, there's also pressure on Taiwan. And Taiwan, as you know, is uh, um, um, under the defense protection of the United States. There's a defense treaty with the United States. And the United States feels obliged to be responsible for Taiwan's um, uh, defense. This has been called strategic ambiguity. It has not been cl made clear what actually uh, America's defense support for, China, for Taiwan would mean. Would the United States come to the military support of Taiwan if there were a Chinese invasion or other, uh, any other military conflict between Taiwan and China? In all reality, we probably can expect that the United States would do something that they would uh, become militarily active, but we don't know for sure. And that ambiguity, that strategic ambiguity is deliberate so that China doesn't know what, would, what to expect. And that hopefully will prevent uh, from, uh, uh, from any, will prevent Beijing from changing the status quo as it has been since the uh, 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 late 1970s. Um, then, of course, there are still also economic and trade disputes with China that ha they have only been temporarily resolved by the one trade, uh, uh, by the one phase trade deal of January 2020, which uh, happened under the Trump administration. That was a compromise where China was uh, had agreed to purchase a lot of American, particularly agricultural goods. But uh, this was a pausing of the trade conflict. It has actually not resolved the conflict. And that conflict will need to be resolved. At the same time, technological uh, um, uh, competition, Huawei is just one key word, that needs to be resolved. And here also the Biden administration and President Xi Jinping and his team have still a lot on their hands. And of course, um, I should add that the purchases that China agreed to make under the one-phase uh, trade deal in January 2020 have not occurred. Only a very small portion of, that, uh, of these purchases have actually been done by China. So again, here, China is actually in breach of its obligations, which it entered into freely and voluntarily. Um, there, is, there are rumors that Taiwan or that uh, uh, Xi Jinping has the ambition 
to reunify, uh, reunify Taiwan properly with China, with the motherland by 2027. We don't know if that is true, but there's a lot of alarm in the Western world that uh, China's ambition are not to uh, continue the status quo of uh, uh, two systems, but uh, of really unifying Taiwan with China uh, under one system. And this would lead to a severe crisis, possibly a military conflict, and therefore uh, this uh, urgently needs to be avoided. And I think that is what the Biden administration is uh, clearly trying to work for uh, in the context of his hybrid uh, foreign policy. However, not, and these are just one of the, some of the uh, conflicts which uh, have unfolded between China and uh, the United States. Another conflict is, of course, the human rights situation in Tibet, in Inner Mongolia, and particularly in Xinjiang and also in Hong Kong. And here, uh, it is almost impossible to see how a compromise could be achieved. While the Western world, justifiably in my view, Hints, uh, looks at Xinjiang and sees lots of violations of human rights. Uh, concentration camps, prison camps, and all sorts of other violations. China, however, says this is necessary for uh, um, counter-terrorism reasons, because otherwise there would be protests, there would be terrorism in Xinjiang. This is not accepted by the West, um, and somehow, this needs to be talked about, this needs to be resolved. But it is clear that the uh, American values, the European values uh, cannot stand for what is happening in Xinjiang and some uh, compromise somehow needs to be achieved and hopefully uh, in some future negotiations, something like that is possible. Um, there is not, it's not all doom and gloom. The Biden administration is cooperating actively with China on climate change. Um, Secretary Kerry was in um, Shanghai only last week and arrived at some compromise deals, some agreement on climate change, how to proceed. And China, as I said, is participating in the uh, climate summit tomorrow, by a digital Zoom uh, climate uh, summit, but it was organized by the Biden administration. This is something which has to be uh, um, welcomed. It's always good to cooperate. Also, we hear that regarding the Iranian nuclear deal, there is uh, possibilities of cooperation between China and the United States and the European countries who are participating in that deal, France, Germany, the UK. Um, and also possibly in the future, there is room for cooperation on North Korea because China also does not want North Korea to ratchet up its nuclear uh, program. They don't want North Korea to collapse, but they certainly don't want to uh, turn North Korea into a, an even more dangerous nuclear power. And that is, of course, in the interest of the uh, United States and the Western world as well. So here is also room for cooperation. And Biden actively pursues that sort of kind of hybrid foreign policy being tough and being competitive, but also leaving the room open for cooperation in as many fields as possible. We know that the Alaska meeting between Secretary of State Blinken and his Chinese uh, counterparts went very badly, particularly the opening session where both delegations almost, almost shouted at each other. But this was a lot of grandstanding particularly the Chinese uh, delegation, but also probably the American administration wanted to impress a domestic audience, wanted to show how tough they were. And I think with that uh, out of the way, perhaps behind closed doors and in more constructive negotiations, uh, better relations, better uh, deals can be achieved. And I also understand that the second day of the Alaska negotiations were much more constructive than that opening meeting, which we all were able to see on uh, television. Of course, China believes that the United States is in decline, that it is a waning power, that the United States is not anymore the superpower it was 10, 20 or 30 years ago, that the United States and the entire Western world 
is on decline and that Asia and in particular China is rising and that the future of the world is an Asian world, is particularly a Chinese world. So that the West basically dominated the 19th and the 20th century and now it's time for the West to go and uh, give room and way to Asia and in particular China. Obviously, that is not the position of the United States. And while China probably believed that the pandemic would be similar to the Great Recession. After the Great Recession between 2008 and 2012, the United States had serious difficulties to get back on its feet. And actually China helped it a lot to do so by stimulating its economy by and thereby stimulating uh, the global economy. Uh, however, uh, the United States, it seems at least, is getting back on its feet after the pandemic much, much better than it did after the Great Recession. And uh, Biden is pushing back to what he believes other uh, people wrongly see as American decline. And thus his initiative on climate change, to be a leader in climate change, to make America the leader in climate change, and also his initiative to cooperate more intensively again with the transatlantic and European allies. So because he knows that the United States is strong, but it is even stronger together with its allies rather than going it alone as Trump, as Trump mistakenly believed uh, was the right way to go. Still, we can also see a system conflict uh, uh, coming uh, uh, to us, and perhaps it has already arrived. While in the past we talk about communism and democracy, as during the Cold War, when the Soviet Union and the United States were at loggerheads, that sort of clear ideology uh, an ideological conflict is not what we see today, but we see a more systemic governance conflict. Who has the better global governance? Who is better to organize its own country and organize a large part of the world? And that is also a, a systemic conflict. And some people now speak of model China and some people speak of the Washington consensus. How that will... Uh, uh, will be resolved and how, what the outcome will be. We don't know, of course, but um, China believes in its model China, while the United States strongly believes that democracy continues to be the future. And that brings me to my third point and to the next slide. And that is the EU and China. Where is the EU? The EU is having much more difficulties with the pandemic than either China and the United States. The EU has uh, not been particularly competent to uh, obtain vaccines and distributing vac vaccines. It is severely suffering. So the United States, uh, sorry, the Europeans will come out of the pandemic probably only in late 2021 or even perhaps in early 2022. So a lot later than China and also later than the United States. However, the, the Europeans will also come out of it. Vaccines, uh, there will be more vaccines uh, being made available soon, and that will also eventually be distribu distributed in a more efficient way than what we see at the moment. Still, the, the Europeans, a strong economic power, even a superpower in economic terms, but certainly not in geopolitical terms, it doesn't really want to antagonize China, but it also doesn't want to antagonize the United States. And for cultural, historical, language, value reasons, uh, the, the European Union and its, mem and its 27 member states plus the UK, they are all much closer to the United States than they are to China. And whenever I was able to travel to China in the past, and I always like traveling to China, it's very nice to meet the very friendly, very nice uh, Chinese people. Um, but whenever I was traveling, and I hope I can travel uh, again soon and come back soon, of course, but whenever I was traveling in the past, I was always asked by, let's say, 
people who were in po into politics or some Chinese officials you meet or think tank people, um, when are the Europeans leaving the United States and coming closer to China and being more friendly with China than with the United States? And I always said, and I still think so, this is a total pipe dream. The you know, Europeans are closer and will always be closer to a country which is simply culturally and historically, also language-wise, economically, value-wise, much closer to them themselves than to a relatively uh, culturally distant country like, like, like China. The, um, and uh, the Europeans, of course, know that. And most members of Europe are also members of NATO. Uh, so that is another link they have with the United States. Still, at the same time, the Europeans, like uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany, does not want to use the term systemic rival. She talks about competition, about rivalry, but not about systemic rivalry. She thinks this is too strong. She wants to be friendly with China, but also friendly with the United States. In a way, the Europeans will try to be sort of neutral in that big clash between China and the United States. China is doing its best to pull the European Union to its side, while the United States, of course, is trying to do the same and more successfully. In December 2020, an investment treaty was signed between China and the EU. That's a provisional investment treaty, which still has to be ratified. That treaty was negotiated for seven years, and eventually, with a lot of effort in December 2020, it was signed. However, in March of this year, March 2021, the European Union imposed sanctions on four Chinese officials and a security company, which were involved apparently in the abuse that is happening in Xinjiang and the human rights violations in Xinjiang. China retaliated immediately by sanctioning 10 European officials, including some parliamentarians, also a German think tank and other people who were dealing with Chinese affairs in, in Europe. So China reacted more strongly and retaliated more strongly than what the Europeans had actually uh, done in terms of sanctions. And ever since, relations between the EU and China have been much worse than they were before. And some people even question whether the European, uh, whether the investment deal with China can actually be ratified anymore in the European Parliament. Because some MPs were sanctioned by China and the whole Parliament is very, uh, let's say, very, um, has been very antagonized by, by uh, the Chinese sanctions. So relations between China and the EU, EU at the moment are also much worse than they ever used to be. And that kind of hope of China, of Beijing, that the EU would remain neutral in any clash, political clash with the uh, United States, I think this is increasingly going out of the window. Um, and what is uh, China doing? It is increasingly going closer to, uh, to Russia as its ally, and it is looking for other allies around the world by means of its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but increasingly, the 14 neighbors of China are increasingly worried about what uh, some people in the West have called a wolf, uh, a wolf warrior diplomacy, a very aggressive way of both politics and diplomacy. So there's urgent need to talk, there's urgent need to resolve uh, issues and not, let, not allow tension to increase further. And this quickly leads me to my fourth point, and that is the quad. Can we have another slide? The quad is a relatively new flexible vehicle. It's not really an organization between uh, the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. And it was created about concern uh, regarding China in the Pacific and the Indo, in the Indo Pacific and in the South China Sea. As I said, it's a flexible organization. It is not a proper organization, but still it brings countries together and it 
makes the Western alliance more comprehensive and includes partners who are not really part of the Western alliance, like India. And this is something China does not like. China is very much upset about uh, the Quad. It says it is an attempt to contain China, to gang up against China. Um, and uh, I can't go into much detail here as we are running out of time. However, we had an interesting session on the Quad last week as one of our Krasno events. If you want to watch the details, it's on our YouTube channel. And I'm sure Priscilla will be pleased to give you the details later if you uh, are interested in watching uh, that uh, long session. Um, India is, like Europe, also very attractive for both China and the United States, and also for the Europeans. The Europeans in India have just agreed on an investment deal, or at least on negotiations for an investment deal. And the United States also is moving increasingly closer to India, while India itself does not want to cut its bridge, all of its bridges with China. However, as we know, the recent fighting in the Himalaya uh, uh, has not improved relations with China either. So what is happening with the Quad is perhaps symbolic for that tendency uh, which we see in the world right now of an alignment of forces. China is trying to rally its ally by means of the Belt and Road Initiative and the United States and the Europeans are also reigning and, uh, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, getting closer with its allies on the other side of the world. But that is in a way not good. If you have two parts of the world which is severely divided and is increasingly less talking to each other and less cooperating, this of course threatens to arrive at serious political and at some stage perhaps even military conflict. Thus the Biden administration's hybrid policy of being tough in terms of politics and uh, insistence on values and human rights, but also leave open the door for cooperation and negotiations on certain areas like climate change, Iran, North Korea, and others makes a lot of sense. But as the saying goes, it takes two to tango. So both Biden and Xi Jinping actually need to come together and you know, uh, try to sort things out and make sure that the situation is not escalating and despite the title of my talk tonight, that that escalation of tensions can be kept under wraps and perhaps can be pushed back again. Let's be hopeful uh, for the future. Maybe the last slide here, outlook for the post-pandemic world. Let's hope that we will uh, defeat the virus this year, 2021, for good, that there will not be a fourth or fifth round of the virus with various other variants coming um, uh, uh, coming into life that you know the virus can be defeated with the help of the pharmaceutical in industry and the vaccine immense vaccine uh, um, uh, um, efforts uh, in all countries including in china and the united states and the european union and in the uk and in india and in many other countries um, that that can uh, and that we can go to a, a, a more co or cooperative post-pandemic world, but a lot of cooperation needs to happen between China and the United States. Of course, we shouldn't forget countries like Russia and India and Europe, of course, but the two dominant players right now are the United States and China. And if you are powerful, you have responsibility, and that responsibility both President Biden and President Xi Jinping need to take and actually get together and talk to each other and hopefully uh, embark on a more constructive course of cooperation with each other. Thank you very much for tonight. So, uh, thank you very much indeed, Klaus. Are there any questions? Um, I have uh, one for you. I read in the newspapers this morning um, that there has been um, a bomb attack in the hotel in Pakistan where the Chinese ambassador and other members of his staff live. 
he wasn't um, in residence at that particular time, but I believe that four people were killed. Um, Pakistan is, I believe, one of the key countries in China's Belt and Road diplomacy. Um, how, how popular is this diplomacy with ordinary people in many of China's Belt and Road partners, or is it creating a backlash of kinds? To, to some extent it is. I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan has become increasingly uh, criticized. Uh, the Chinese and the Pakistanis have formed what they call a Pakistani corridor, an economic corridor, which was supposed to bring a lot of uh, goods and trade to Pakistan and would also, of course, uh, uh, benefit China, particularly in terms of uh, uh, resources. That um, uh, corridor is not flourishing. It has been criticized a lot that the deal was actually very uneven, that Pakistan is being exploited. But Pakistan is a very uh, unstable country at the uh, best of times. And um, with the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan, um, China has actually decided, and it has been doing that for the last few years, to go into that opening uh, vacuum of, in Afghanistan. Because China, like the United States, is concerned about terrorism, about Islamist fundamentalist terrorism, which may rise again once the United States and once the NATO countries have departed Afghanistan for good in September uh, of this year at the latest. And when you become an increasingly important and powerful uh, player in the world, increasing in, in, including increasingly in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kazakhstan, then you also open yourself up to attacks. These are attacks not necessarily meant against China as such, but sometimes they are meant for local uh, um, uh, actors of the Chinese government. Sometimes they are targeted at Beijing. It's difficult to judge. And I really don't know much about who was behind the Pakistani uh, bombing this morning. Um, but when you become more powerful and influential in the world, uh, as the United States also noticed from the 1970s onwards, you open yourself up to criticism and also to violent attacks against yourself. And I think China has been experiencing that since it became a more powerful player in world politics since the 2000s and certainly uh, uh, since uh, for the last few years. Right. Um, other questions? I have a question here from uh, uh, a Krasno person, that is Isa Ghana, who says, what role do you think NGOs will play to either increase or decrease cooperation between China and the United States? Yeah, that's a good question. It's difficult to say. But these days, it's not just states which play a role. Uh, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, also think tanks and what they call uh, Track 1.5 organizations, uh, all these uh, actors play a much more important role than they did only 10, certainly 20 years ago. So I would say that NGOs are not without influence, but uh, in the last resort, neither NGOs or international organizations or think tanks will really call the shots, particularly as far as the United States and China are concerned. Here, the states are still very much in charge. And as we know from China, of course, Xi Jinping is very much looking after the Chinese state and the Communist Party. And even domestically, we think of Jack Ma, for example, and important, global, uh, important economic players in China. Xi Jinping does not tolerate any rivalry from any other actor in uh, domestic uh, uh, affairs in China, and certainly also not regarding China's uh, foreign policy. It actually hear me. I can hear you, yes. Well, there's a huge break. 
Reddit uh, saying that China is forcing countries within the one uh, one world order program, those uh, less powerful countries, to deal with the uh, business issues to benefit the China Chinese government. So what's your opinion on this? I didn't quite catch that. Could you repeat that, Priscilla? Uh, yes, Oliver um, said there are allegations that uh, China, um, in its Belt and Road policy, okay. is um, forcing the countries involved to accept disadvantageous economic deals as the price of getting Chinese aid. Um, would you care? to comment on that. And perhaps I could add a rider as well. There's been a good deal um, of pressure for debt um, moratoriums or even for debt forgiveness um, in the wake of the pandemic um, and the economic problems that it has caused to debt nations. Um, so perhaps you could comment on that too. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, China's so-called debt uh, diplomacy in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative is very controversial and it's very difficult to judge. You know, is China doing that deliberately or is it just, um, you know, that is, uh, is um, the situation that countries are um, pursuing a not very clever financial policy and then go into debt and then turn to the Chinese and ask for, for aid. The most famous example is Sri Lanka and where that deal which the Sri Lankan uh, government entered into turned to be turned out to be very disadvantageous to Sri Lanka. So they uh, leased the port of Sri Lanka for 99 years to China. And that caused a lot of controversy uh, uh, all, uh, all over the world. Whether that is a deliberate policy by China is difficult to say. That China, of course, is looking after its own affairs and that it uh, pushes countries into deals which are more advantageous for China rather than for these countries. That is pretty clear. Here, China is behaving like a good capitalist, you can say. If you can get a good deal and you exploit the other side, then you do that. That is what capitalists have done all over the world. Of course, it is more surprising that a communist country like China would do that. However, whether it is intentional right from the, the start to get these countries into difficulties so that in the end they have no choice but to, let's say, lease an, an, a port to China, this is very questionable. And I don't think you, we should immediately say that has been the intention right from the start. But the outcome of many of these deals has clearly been disadvantageous for the other country and more advantageous uh, for China. Many African countries, uh, for example, uh, mm -hmm. that applies to also the uh, European, the small European nation of Montenegro uh, has a deal uh, with China to build a highway. And that highway is the most expensive highway in the world. It is only half built and Montenegro cannot continue uh, uh, building it. But China wants to have uh, its debt back and uh, wants to also, uh, the contract is to build it. And China insists on that. So Montenegro has now appealed to the European Union to help it out in its uh, uh, struggle with China, its financial struggle with China. Um, so this is the typical dilemma you're referring to. Um, these are very unfortunate cases. Whether China uh, intended to do that right from the start is, we don't know, but the, the outcomes of some of these deals are certainly very disadvantageous for the nations affected. Regarding forgiving debt in the pandemic, I would say this is in principle a good idea. But one has to look, of course, at the individual country, who deserves it, who doesn't deserve it. You would not like to forgive debt to a country which then goes around and puts all uh, the saved money into its military budget or into the pockets of the super rich while neglecting the uh, common men and woman, uh, women in that country. So it has to be done on a case to case, on a country to country basis. But on the whole, of course, I always believe in solidarity. Uh, the pandemic has not been caused by uh, uh, anyone, by certainly not by African, poor African countries, and they need to be helped. 
as we know, some uh, um, uh, Western countries, some uh, rich countries like China, like the United States, like the European countries, they have weathered the pandemic despite all sacrifices they are making as well. Uh, they have still weathered the pandemic much better than uh, a poor African country. And so I think it is only fair to try our best to help them, but we also need to look uh, you know, who would actually benefit it. We don't want to support the billionaires in some small African country. We want to uh, support the common people and help them out of poverty, help them uh, uh, out of starvation. But we don't want to enhance the, the rich uh, in these countries anymore. Yes, well, uh, you sound like a good socialist, or do I mean a social democrat, Klaus? <laughs> well, I think I'm, I'm just a, I have just a little bit of common sense and I believe in solidarity when it is appropriate. A global solidarity. It's uh, my personal belief that a good deal of money that's being poured into the Belgian road, uh, China is going to have to probably wave it goodbye in the end. That, um, some of these investments are not particularly well thought out um, and that um, the money is going to evaporate basically that it's it's not going to come back and they probably will not be able to make the kinds of deals that they would like but um, we can talk about that some other time perhaps um, Or, or from any questions from the people um, out there, uh, from the uh, Krasno listeners. I can't see any written questions anymore. They would have to, um, uh, you know, you're, everyone is most welcome to submit a question. I will try my best uh, to answer them. But so far, I can't see any more questions. Well, um, perhaps then at this point, um, since I know it's getting rather late in Chapel Hill, and I know that you're a night owl, but even so, um, it is getting late in the evening for you to continue this session, and I have a class before too long. Now, what I would normally like to do is at this point, um, bring out one of our delectable souvenirs, such as plates, paperweights, um, and other items that you can put on your shelves for them to get. <laughs> um, but they show that you've been here, or even some of our slightly more useful souvenirs. We have a nice slide now um, with leather-bound books and pens and the like. Um, but alas, I can't do that. Um, nor well, you, you, can make, you can make up for it by just inviting me again when it's uh, possible to travel and I will be coming. Uh, a new question. A new question has just come on. So, okay. do you think China will still continue to grow more prosperous under President Xi's leadership? Wow, that's a difficult question. Um, on the whole, the way it is going, I would say yes. The economy in China is doing well. It is roaring back after the pandemic. Um, there will need to be a trade deal with the United States. The investment treaty, I think, ought to be implemented despite all the recent uh, problems um, so that both European companies uh, have a more open Chinese market, but also that Chinese companies can make use of the European market under the terms of the treaty. And if that happens so that globalization is not killed off, but is further expanded in a sensible way without, you know, having uh, the, the workers in the factories make the sacrifices. So they all should get a proper deal and proper wages 
and environmental standards should be observed. But under these uh, pretexts, you know, it, uh, globalization should continue. And if that is the case, with the help of these mutual uh, uh, bilateral and mutual multilateral trade deals, I would say that the Chinese economy will continue to prosper. Um, the world wants Chinese products. And there is, of course, talk to cut supply uh, chains that countries want to become more independent, more independent from China regarding medical equipment, regarding pharmaceutical goods, um, including masks and um, vaccines. And I think this will, is also a phenomenon that we will see that globalization, as we saw it until recently, where supply chains were almost shifted entirely to China in important products, that that will not continue. That you know, countries in important uh, uh, survival uh, industries will develop their own production capacity. Um, but that means also that most consumer goods, which you and I use daily, from computers, from memory sticks, from chips to um, all sorts of um, uh, entertainment things, uh, and also clothes and so on, uh, that these will still continue to be done on a global uh, 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 basis. And I think China is still best equipped together with other countries in the region like Vietnam, for example, and Cambodia increasingly, to, to furnish these goods to the rest of the world. So I would say yes, on the whole, uh, the, the, Ch the Chinese economy is also more innovative than many people thought uh, only 10 years ago, uh, that China is um, creating uh, uh, imaginative goods. And that is also a new market for China, which they uh, you know, will exploit. So I would say, at least for the short to medium term future, um, the world probably wants Chinese goods. And as long as the world uh, buys Chinese goods, I'm sure Chinese factories will be happy to supply them. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, Klaus. Um, having uh, given you uh, whatever uh, souvenir of City U, um, I have picked out from our store cupboard, uh, we would then have a group photo with you because what is life or any event without the group photo? Sure. Created. Alas, that too is impossible, though we could probably Photoshop you into one. Um, oh. And I um, created a fake evidence that you had been here uh, in person uh, rather than simply remotely. And we would then be thinking of rolling down the hill, um, maybe to that nice Italian restaurant in the Altiera. They do very good set, at, um, set menus now. I've got a friend who takes me there quite often. Or maybe to the nice Portuguese restaurant um, in the Regency Art Hotel, which has been a quarantine hotel, by the way, since you were last there. Um, Macau's not had any deaths, um, and only, I think, 50 cases of COVID-19 in part due to its very strict um, quarantine regulations here, strict border controls. So we would now perhaps be um, chatting happily, um, saying, well, that didn't go too badly, did it? Um, and then thinking about a journey for a pleasant lunch. However, it is gone 11 in Chapel Hill, I believe, so you may instead be thinking of turning in for the night. Um, take a rain check on the meal and we'll try and get you here um, as soon as the borders reopen. And yes, please, let me know as soon as you can. And let me also say I'm very impressed that your students, your people are actually live in the classroom. We are still teaching online, but we do hope to go back to the classroom in August, I think.
but I'm very impressed that you are all in the classroom. You don't have to deal with Zoom on a daily basis. So I also notice you're still wearing masks. Is that necessary and required? It's required whether it is necessary. I'm not entirely sure. Have you been um, vaccinated? Oh, yes. Both, both shots now. Yeah. Uh, one last week. I still can't go anywhere. I don't think ever in my life have I been 38 months within the confines of just one city, however pleasant and scenic it may be. I believe that Macau, the population density is second only to that in the Gaza Strip. Um, <laughs> but I, I've been here since mid-March of last year now. Um, but we've been teaching in person since August last August. Right. Uh, so that, that has been, I think, a considerable help. And I'm afraid that... But Priscilla, we can't see you properly. Your head is cut off from the screen. You need to go a bit... Yeah, that's much better. You can, you can see me now. That's um, much better, yeah. yeah. And Macau, um, they now... At first, it was only basic masks um, with, uh, I think it was eight a week given out um, for uh, 10 a week, given for a nominal sum uh, to people. Now, um, Macau has got into manufacturing uh, rather attractive made in Macau masks in a variety right. of patents. So we can at least go around in the streets, not just wearing our um, plain pale blue ones. Uh, we can be so some people do still have them, we can be a bit more creative about our precautions. Uh, but yes, sometime I'll tell you what it's been, um, the pros and cons of being in Fortress Macau. Uh, <laughs> by now I've got library books that are cut um, from Hong Kong that are coming to the end of their two, two year maximum borrowing period um, in late June. So I would be quite pleased if the borders with Hong Kong at least reopened. Yeah, it has been a great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Well, um, as I said, um, next year in person, let us hope. Absolutely. On your way to or from China. Yeah. Uh, great. You take care. You too. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. Bye. Thank you.